Chapter 6, Hedgewitch. The word immediately had a different meaning to fairies. Philip had expected a step-by-step -step plan for his magical training. Instead, Eris fluttered about, human-sized but still gliding across the grass, muttering about his and Joanna's apparently insufficient camp setup. She pulled out a wand from the bell sleeves of her dress and swished it over her head. The nearby trees creaked and groaned, tilting over the little clearing until they formed a roof of leaves and branches. Philip shuddered. Why was it always plants? Frike stayed near Joanna and helped her move through a series of painful-looking stretches to keep the muscles of her neck from getting stiff. What, uh... Philip rubbed the back of his neck and looked around. What should I be doing? Poena, arranging several newly formed magical stools that looked like they wouldn't hold up under anyone other than a fairy, glanced at him over her shoulder with wide eyes. Watch us, Eris said quickly. Witness the ease with which we call upon our magic. Philip observed the fairies for a few minutes as they continued to wave their wands and make changes to the campsite. They didn't mutter any spells or do any intri intricate gestures other than waving their wands here and there. Magic didn't look so hard when they did it. You said I developed magic, but you never told me how, said Philip. Poena looked at Eris, and Eris said, Your capacity for doing magic likely always existed. The source of your magic is likely the result of a forgotten gift. As in, one of your ancestors was gifted magic, but not a physical gift. That was awakened by circumstance, like your fight with those thieves. Philip remembered the stories his father told him about his ancestors. He was sure if there had been a wizard on his father's side of the family, he would have heard about it. But maybe his mother had an old relative with magic that she had never gotten a chance to tell about. Philip supposed there was no way of knowing now. I've been in fights before, said Philip. Why didn't it show itself then? Unfortunately, until we learn more about your magic, I can't say for sure why it made itself known that night, Eris said. Now, do you see how we channel our magic? Eris twirled her wand in a graceful, flowing gesture. Her magic was a pale yellow glint in the air, flickering around the tent still packed atop Samson's back. Samson snorted and stamped, spinning in a circle to see what was happening above him, and a thick branch removed, from, removed the tent from the pack. The magic encircled the wood in a pale gold glow, and the branch moved like a finger. Slowly, it set up the tent. Fairies focus magic through wands from trees that sprouted the same day we were born. This always this allows us to call up or stop our magic at will. You will be unable to do that since you are human. A wizard's power usually comes from a staff or is tied to it in some way. But you have no such source or tie, and we do not have the time to craft one. You will have to use your magic differently. If you are going to steal the sword of truth and shield of virtue, Eris gestured for Philip to sit on one of the summoned stools. What did you feel when your magic first appeared during the fight? your fight with those thieves? Philip raised one shoulder. Nothing. It just happened. Likely, he is too unfamiliar with the feeling to identify it, said Poana to Eris summoning fire from her wand with a quick swish. The flames crackled in the pit between them, and she shooed Eris to a stool. This was your idea, so you are in lead. In the lead. I will help Frike with the girl, and then finish making this place. She looked, glanced around at the clearing and drew in a shallow breath. Livable. How kind of you, Eris said, the right side of her mouth quirking up. Now, Philip. When you are in the water, do you feel every tide, small and large, or do you only notice that there were there once you've left the water? Poena flew away, and Philip tried to focus on Eris. I noticed them after, 
Unless they're strong, he said. So I guess I need to learn what my magic feels like, and then I can master it? Just so, Eris said, and smiled. She fluffed out the long skirts of her dress, the fabric spilling across the grass like honey, and adjusted herself so that they could speak without the others overhearing. Magic is about belief and intuition. You must trust that you are feeling what you are feeling is your magic, and believe in yourself in order to utilize it. Philip groaned. If I believe I can, I can? Don't be impertinent, Eris said. If you believe you can touch fire and not be burned, you can't. If you believe you can touch fire and your magic will stop you from being burned, you can. See the difference? Not really. I suppose, he said. The difference is that magic is not like a sword. It requires training. It's, but its presence is often enough to allow for small workings, like the nature magic you used against Joanna. Philip nodded. When you imagine things, do you see them happening in your mind? She asked. Philip nodded again. Daydreaming was one of the only ways he had survived his time as a squire. That's how magic works, said Eris. You must imagine what you want your magic to do. This can cause issues. Do you see what those issues could be? Not knowing what you want? Philip asked. He had wanted Sire and Joanna to get away from him both times, and his magic had done that, even if he hated how it had accomplished it. Exactly, Eris said, and clapped once. Which brings us to belief. If you do not believe you can do something, how can you even imagine it? If you don't trust yourself to know what you want, then you can't imagine anything at all, can you? What Eris described felt distant and unobtainable. If Philip had never improved, was it because he didn't believe in himself or because something else was wrong? Sword fighting, at least, allowed you to know when you were getting better. Writing had visible results. Do you know what you want from life, Philip? Eris asked, seeming to sense his doubt. Philip startled. No one had ever asked him that, not once in all his years of training and talking about the future. They assumed he wanted what his father had decided for him or that he was willing to cast aside everything for what was needed. Worse, he worried they didn't even consider him a whole person with wants of his own. He couldn't even think of one goal he had solely for himself. I don't know, he said trying to sort out the odd feeling the question dredged up in him. Eris's brows pinched together. Oh, well, think on it. Magic needs a person to trust themselves. It requires a confidence mo most do not have. I am very good at magic. That is not egotism. That is fact. I am good at magic because I trust that I am good enough to do what I want and that what I want is right. Philip swallowed and fiddled with a long blade of grass. Have you always known what you wanted to do with your life? Oh, no. I was a little monster as a child. Bright-eyed and eager, but, no, but with no conviction to do what was necessary to achieve my goals, Eris said and laughed. A loud and unrestrained sound that couldn't have been anything other than sincere. I had a mentor that set me straight. Unfortunately, I don't have decades to help you figure out what you want from your life. A feeling Philip couldn't place bloomed low in his stomach. It was light and fluttering, and it was almost hopeful. If Eris had been a monster and sorted it all out, surely he could? We have twenty days. Twenty days until Maleficent's curse, yes, said Eris. But I want you to think about yourself. Do you trust yourself? Do you believe in yourself? And just like before, Philip couldn't rightly answer. Knights followed orders and trusted in their su superiors enough to let lead on their behalf, and they had to be certain of their orders so as to undertake them without thought. They served and believed in the king. Philip might have been the prince, but he was still beholden to his father. 
He hadn't trusted the demands made of him in years. However, trusting no one did else didn't mean he trusted himself. Eris had known him for only half a day and had already cut to the heart of him. Don't tell me now, Eris said and stood. Her hand came to rest on his shoulder. Think about it. Think about what makes you believe someone knows what they're doing. Think about where your confidence comes from. As we move through your training, we will test you to make sure you have progressed appropriately. If your confidence falters, you will not pass. Philip sighed. He had done many things he hated in his life, but considering himself was the worst one. It was like looking into a mirror, but the mirror could talk back. He didn't want to think about what he wanted in case he could never have it. All he could think about was the rustle of the leaves in the trees, the brush of the breeze gliding through his hair, and the sharp scent of the pines. The sky was a drowning blue dusk crowning the lingering clouds with a dark violet. A yawn cracked open his jaws. Perhaps I was hasty, said Eris, drawing his attention. She patted his soldier, shoulder. You have had a trying time and you likely need your rest before we truly begin to train. Thank you, Philip said, and I think my mind will be clearer tomorrow. Maybe he would wake up and this would have all been a dream. Philip was looking forward to the void of sleep, to closing his eyes and opening them to the bright morning, having slept away the exhaustion without being any the wiser to it. He hoped Briar Rose might have already uncovered a way to stop their shared dreaming. He wouldn't put it past her to make demands upon their shared nightmare. Once, she had shushed a rooster while she was trying to read. Worse, the rooster had quieted. He opened one eye. A lush green tapestry rippled above him. The smoky evening sky peeking through the cracks in the leaves. The scent of the damp earth washed over Philip, and he stretched before standing. Cracking his bare toes against a mossy log, he looked around. This dream was different. The dream wood had changed. Gone were never-ending trees and towering thorn wall. Instead, there were hedges twice his height that writhed with thorny vines, and he was in a thin gap between two of them. Before him, the path veered left and right. Behind him, it turned right. A maze, one that went on for as far as he could see. Really, he asked, now I have things to do in my dreams? A soft laugh drifted over one of the maze walls. You don't have to do anything, you know. Sitting where you are and doing nothing is an option. You're good at that. Philip flinched. Usually when he was dreaming, there was no one around to judge his comments. It was one of the rare times he knew for sure he wasn't being listened to or observed, either by Joanna, his father, and tutors, or Briar Rose. Now, he didn't even have privacy in his dreams. Not if you're here, he said, not bothering to hide his annoyance. I take it you're in a maze too? I think so. I haven't had a chance to look around, Briar Rose yawned. Yes, there are three paths before me. First we could talk, now we're in a maze. Something's changed. Has anything new happened to you? I couldn't say that it has, said Philip, studying his nails. From Briar Rose's question, he assumed she hadn't overheard what had been happening to him in the real world, and he wasn't about to offer it to her. He wasn't even sure what to think about his magic yet. He didn't even need her opinions on it. Has anything in your life changed? She exhaled softly but did not answer. Philip crept toward the wall he could hear her through. Briar Rose, he exclaimed in mock shock. We are trapped in this mystery together and you're withholding information? I am not, she sniffed. He liked to imagine what she looked like when she talked. She did it so often that he had no other choice. She gestured endlessly in his mind, twirling her hands as she explained things she had learned to, to her goat or rabbits, 
tapping her finger against her lip as she thought about what to say next. It was almost cute. Save for the frustratingly mysterious circumstances that cra kept trapping them together, nothing out of the ordinary is happening with me, she said slowly. I just had a disagreement with my aunts. It's nothing. I can't imagine why anyone would ever disagree with you, since you are always so pleasant to be around, said Philip. Getting her to complain would keep her from realizing he wasn't being truthful about his circumstances. He could practically hear her rolling her eyes. I don't disagree with my aunts often. Because they always agree with you? Philip cracked his neck and slowly walked toward the split path ahead of him. They once let you take a break from studying for a whole week just because you asked. It had been the week of Philip's first tournament, and he had wanted nothing more than to sleep for longer than four hours uninterrupted. Do you think we could peek through the walls? Friar Rose asked. No, he said quickly. The leaves and vines making up the walls of his new maze moved continuously, like snakes twisting in a nest. Given the nature of the old thorn wall, I don't trust them. Still, she said, nothing to lose but by trying. Philip hated that she was right. They were dreaming, so they couldn't actually get hurt, and they needed to figure out why this was happening to them sooner rather than later. If she hadn't mentioned it, he probably would have done it. But he disliked that she had suggested it first. Might lose a finger, Philip muttered but neared the wall. He wiped his face and brushed the dirt from his clothes, but given the wildness of the day, he wasn't sure what he looked like, even in the dream. He didn't want to look horrible the first time Briar Rose saw him, though. Hi. The hedges were all identical enough, taller than him, dense with leaves and vines, and seemingly alive. They reminded Philip more of the thorn wall than of the old dream forest, and he tried to peek through the one between Briar Rose and him. The vine snapped shut. All he got was a flash of pale gold, like a sunrise reflected in a rippling pool on the other side. No, don't touch the walls, he said, and proded one of the vines. It unfurled, thorns snashing together toward him. I am not in the mood tonight, Prickly. Are you talking to the wall? Briar Rose asked in an amused drawl. Philip sniffed and brushed a hand through his hair. It's a popular pastime where I'm from, I assure you. She laughed in response, and he found himself smiling. So this, definite, this is definitely a maze. Do you think we're in the same one or in mirrored mazes? She asked. It was almost endearing how focused she was on fixing this. She couldn't let anything rest, not the mystery of this maze or who had stolen her custard tarts. He admired, though he never admitted, how tenaciously she went after she, what she needed. There was no goal too lofty for Briar Rose. He had never been like that. He wished he were. If it's mirrored, then I should be able to turn left and abandon you, he said. Walking down the leftward path, I wish, she said, Philip could hear the smile in her voice. A pity, then. I must deny your wish, Philip smirked, pleased when he turned left and her voice continued to come from over the wall to his right, despite what that defined all reason. Here's my major question. What's at the end? What do you mean? Labyrinths all have ends, centers, or escapes. So what's the end? Of, what's at the end of this one? He asked, peeking around the corner before him. There was only one more hedge in both directions. What's the prize? I don't think it's a labyrinth," said Briar Rose slowly. "Labyrinths are universal. It would be difficult for us to be in the same labyrinth and not know it. That means there's only one path. By the way, oh." So one path to the outside of the labyrinth we're in. Got it. He knew, she knew that he knew what a labyrinth was, 
and what universal mean, meant, and he didn't care for it one bit. Forgive me, she said. I've caught you skipping so many lessons in my dreams that I can't remember which ones I overheard you attending. That squashed Philip's growth, growing affection for her. He stomped down his path. He had been a good student, always listening and obeying and exhausting himself in the pursuit of perfection until about 13. It was an unspoken agreement among the pages, neglecting their health to be better students, and tired eyes were as much a badge of honor as making it to squire. He'd been younger than everyone, and there he'd been competing to be the best. He had to be the best, unless he wanted to be the prince, who w couldn't cut it as at a night. It didn't matter that he was a younger and that he was younger and smaller. He was to be Princess Aurora's protector, so he had to train far longer than everyone else. His life had been nothing but not quite there, and could always learn a bit more. And he had tried, really tried, until his first tournament. I hope the end of this maze rids me of you forever. Don't be rude, she replied. He ground his teeth together. Then don't pretend you know me. Philip took off down the left-hand path. It should have led him away from her, far out of earshot, and hopefully toward whatever was at the end of this. It would have been different if he could have spoken directly to Briar Rose before. But she had possibly heard so many of his worst moments, his vulnerable moments, and his moments that should have been only for him. It had all been one-sided, and he didn't fully know what all she had seen. His lessons had certainly figured into her dreams, given what she had said. Had she seen only the worst of him? Philip stopped and took a breath. Had he seen only the worst of her? Briar Rose, he called out. Can you still hear me? I know you walked away, but it still sounds like you're right next to me, she said. And he could hear her easily despite the thick thorn wall and her quiet tone. I moved as, as far as I could from the wall I thought was separating us as well. Of course she had ignored his outburst and was still trying to solve this. Architecture in dreams never makes sense normally, according to Joanna, so this isn't too much of a surprise, said Philip. It was probably his fault they were in this mess, not that he would never ever admit that. This maze is going to be a problem. It's already exhausting to go to sleep expecting rest and suddenly having to listen to the emotional turmoil being wrought upon a stranger who can never help, even if he know exactly what they need. She sighed. I'm sorry, you're just off traveling and that's all I want right now. Philip froze. You wanted to help me? He asked quietly. Of course. You sounded so sad. Well, he hated when she put it like that. But she didn't sound like she was lying. She sounded like she cared. Briar Rose scoffed. Look, Philip, we're stuck here whether we like it or not. We should, as adults, be able to set aside our differences and pass to work together. Philip had been trapped in enough overly pruned hedge mazes and various noble parties to know what a hedge maze looked like, and he'd eavesdropped on Briar Rose long enough to know where she was going with this. She was as competitive as he was. I bet I can get there first, said Philip, leaning as close to the wall as he dared. I bet I get there long before you. What are we betting? Briar Rose asked and it sounded as if she was as near the wall as he was. Philip glanced around and said, Whenever's at the end, there has to be something there. Otherwise, why make the maze and drop us in it? Whoever gets there first gets it for good. You think our dreams have been leading up to a competition? From the sound of it, she had started walking. That's a bit bleak. Is it? he asked, and followed her lead. You agree? Of course, she said laughing. And when I get there first, I'll have the decently to tell you what I want. You are the soul of generosity. 
She laughed again, loud and full-throated and utterly unlike the titter her aunts had taught her to do. Don't lose too quickly, she said. I like a challenge. Not more than me, Philip grinned. If he couldn't succeed in his waking life, he would crush the problems of his dreaming world.